This is Gem Archer, and you're listening to the Stage Left podcast. In fucking <laughs> one. <laughs> Didn't ask you to write it down or anything. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to a very special episode of the Stage Left Podcast uh, with Gem Archer of Oasis and Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds. Um, this is a guy who I, I didn't tell him at the time um, when we met up and went to his studio, but um, years ago, uh, Melody Maker released uh, uh, some posters and amongst many posters on my bedroom wall of lots of different people, uh, Gem and this particular uh, guitar he had, the uh, Firebird, the Gibson Non-Reverse Firebird, uh, was on my wall and I grew up wanting to play that guitar. Uh, went to his studios and bless him he actually let me play uh, the real thing um, and you can see photos of that on our Instagram page uh, what a guy it's his first interview in five years um, since actually he, he had quite a serious um, brain injury he talks about in the uh, in the episode a TBI which is traumatic brain injury um, and uh, how that's affected him um, uh, since that happened about five years ago uh, he also talks about um, playing the recent Manchester show uh, Manchester Arena the first show there that meant so much to so many people playing Don't Back in Anger. Um, he talks, he gets goosebumps actually when he, when he talks about that. It's, it's very, very special to listen to. Um, he talks through the Oasis split. Um, he talks through the Death in Vegas sessions, which were a whole album worth of material that was never released. Um, the Roller, Hung in a Bad Place, loads of stuff for over an hour and a half. Um, hope you really enjoy it. Um, you can check out all the episodes featuring the likes of Aziz Ibrahim, uh, former Stone Roses guitarist, where he breaks down how he uh, learned uh, John Squire's parts and wrote songs with Ian Brown. Um, we have uh, Tony Visconti on producing Blackstar, uh, Steve Cropper of Booker T and the MGs, um, and obviously lots of um, episodes related to Noel Gallagher and, and Oasis that we've had on Paul Gallagher, which is really interesting, uh, Noel and Liam's brother talking about growing up with them guys, and of course Russ Pritchard recently, um, and Mikey Rowe, who are part of the High Flying Birds, um, and loads and loads of episodes. That's at thestageleftpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at the Stage Left Pod and like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Stage Left Podcast. Uh, the next episode is with Abby from the Zootons, who's just gone from being kind of stage left in the Zootons to centre stage under the name Abby Chan Music. Um, so, or Abby Chan, actually. Um, so, yeah, uh, check that out. That's going to come out in about a month. And, and we've also got Wolfgang Flow of Craftwork being recorded soon as well. Um, as you'll hear in my intro, we do this for free, but uh, if you want to buy us a coffee, you can do that on the on the uh, website the stage left podcast.com um actually i don't drink coffee so we'll probably buy a bottle of red wine uh, maybe a bottle of yellow tail actually that might be a good choice um so uh, yeah um that's the name of the bdi song for those who didn't realize that um so uh, yeah if uh, if you want to get involved uh, come to the stage left podcast.com and uh, yeah give us a shout um so this is it this is a very very special episode uh, what a privilege it was um, thank you so much again for agreeing to do this and so here we go, this is Gem Archer. Okay, welcome to the Stage Left podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. The podcast exists to provide free educational content for young musicians going into an increasingly complex industry by telling the stories of some of the unsung heroes behind the success. Today we're joined by the elegant, gifted guitarist and songwriter Gem Archer. Gem's day job is to perform truly classic songs uh, that are deeply woven into the fabric of modern Western music, uh, and Gem has written and performed on uh, records that will be listened to by many, many generations to come. Today we'll be talking about uh, Gem's early influences, uh, we'll be talking uh, Hung in a Bad Place, The Roller, uh, his live contribution to classics such as Don't Look Back in Anger and Champagne Supernova, uh, how the creative process uh, shifted when going from uh, a singer in his own right in the criminally underrated heavy stereo to writing songs to be sung by Liam Gallagher. Uh, we'll get advice to young guitarists, uh, find out what the future holds, who the quiet ones were, and we'll be finding out if the rumours are true that Gem once headlined the Bullen Gate in Kentish Town dressed only in a boiler suit. Uh, so it's a pleasure to say that our guest today on the Stage Left podcast is none other than Gem Archer. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Gem. How's it going? Um, <clears throat> bamboozled by that intro. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I mean, we met in uh, we met in Rome a couple of months ago when we were recording the Russ Pritchard episode, and um, you were supporting you two on on, on a tour. Uh, how did that pan out? How was that? Um, well, it's uh, it's fantastic, but like from a viewpoint of 
I don't think anybody too is like them. Yeah. It's a different level. And we knew that and it's kind of I don't know. Not be flip on it, but when we heard about it, it I th- I was using words like it's like rock and roll voyeurism or something because <laughs> you know, you know, it's yeah. uh, we we've all been in a million backstages and everybody yeah. does it differently and you know, we've toured with especially in the Oasis days. It was I mean, we did a tour with the Black Crows, yeah, and they like a lot of dressing room accoutrements, yeah, and it's all. And they used to take the piss out of us because they'd come in and we'd have a boombox literally on the bin, really? just that. And they were like, "Shh, just walk out." Like all oh, good, you know. But you go in their room, and it's it's what you'd expect. Now, you too. I mean, you know, just even the scale of it. But I haven't said that. First day, Edge's guitar guy couldn't have been more, whatever the word is, one of us. Oh, nice. You know, yeah. come and have a look at this, have a look at that. Right. You know, and I've had a look at all your gear, and what's your favourite amp to record, and just being really, and you're welcome any time nice. in his little hut under the stage. So that's normal to me, yeah. in, in, without sounding like a dick, you know yeah. what I mean? So you just, we, if you play guitars and you, and you tune guitars and all that, you usually like talking without going over the top about them, I suppose. It's an interest, isn't it? Better than fishing. Yeah. Well, to some. <laughs> well, actually, on that subject, so one of the things we were talking about, we were, so we were Mikey, yourself, and Russ, and Mikey was lamenting the fact that you weren't going to have a sound check for that particular gig, um, which from a young, uh, if you think about young musicians, a lot of gigs they play, they have to kind of plug in and play straight away and, yeah. and have no sound checks. Um, you must have some experience of that, but how does that specifically change your preparation knowing you're not going to get a sound check? Um, <clears throat> it's all about, uh, and most people will say this, if you have a good gig and you haven't had a sound check, then you don't. Then you start not liking sound checks and all that. And when you do festivals, you don't get sound checks. Yeah, yeah. And all that. Sometimes a sound check can really, you know, ruffle your feathers, as it really? were. Yeah. It sometimes, because it's well, yeah. But there's a massive difference nowadays that, especially if you're using in ears mm. and all that, and everything's kind of, you can almost take your rehearsal to the sound check in a mm. way, to the gig. Yeah. You yeah. know, because you, you're not dealing with, you know side fills and wedges and all that it's a different yeah. way now but um do you prefer it that way with ears? i love it really without a shadow of a doubt it takes about a month to get used to yeah. but I, I without a doubt man do you miss anything from not having in-ears though do you do you miss tinnitus <laughs> <laughs> um it, seriously it used to take us about a month for me ears to settle down after a tour really? the missus coming in and Going, do you have to have the telly that loud? And you know, I don't know. It's because the reporters Noel got tinnitus a while ago as well. Like he's got super ears, man. Is he? he he's oh, he, he he prides himself on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got some supernatural shit going on. But yeah, we've all, I suppose, done all right. It's not like the old days of mm. you know them ridiculous volumes that people used to play at. I don't know. It's it, in ears are it for me. Fantastic. So you're known as for being quite an unflustered character, and and the word that Russ used to describe you was he, he, it was elegance around your guitar playing. Um, what's the most pressure you felt on stage in recent years, and how did you deal with it? Oh man, well, it's not. I don't think. I don't think you allow yourself to feel pressure. Mm. Maybe it's all about that thing again, isn't it? If, I, I used to say, like, if you're thinking on stage, you're fucked. Ah, oh, right. Because yeah. it's got to just flow. And once you start... Like, I'll talk with Mikey sometimes about... It's normally with gear, and you're just thinking, oh, yeah, and you're thinking about something else that's coming up. And, oh, yeah, and this change and that. And, and that's when you start messing up. Go out the and then there's obviously the odd thing, like, when you know, oh, yeah... Does that solo start on a B flat right up that high end? It could be. Just go for it, you know, and all that yeah. shit. But every, that's normal as well, you know. Yeah. And so, press, I don't know. It's mainly about. Look, within reason, nothing matters. Mm. Everybody fucks up. Yeah. Maybe. 
trepidation about that last Manchester gig we did. Yeah, of course. Because it was the first one and all yeah. that. And it, it was in everybody's eyes mm. all throughout the day. Everybody, you know, and everybody was upbeat. It was, certainly wasn't weird. But you do feel that's not one to have a stinker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And how did you deal with that? Did you just prepare more or did it, was it just a case you just relaxed I mean you know the songs the anyway, only we, we, the only thing we did funnily enough is we'd had a bit of a layoff after yeah. the U2 leg and so Noel wanted to do a long sound check which basically meant doing the whole set Yeah. so there's bringing about the sound check thing we did the whole thing yeah and that, that worked maybe yeah so you're going on tour. You're leaving in the morning, right? Yeah. Yeah, going to Mexico. Yeah. So would you have rehearsals at a rehearsal studio in London, or would you just go out to Mexico? There was talk it... of rehearsing in Mexico. Really? And we were all buzzing for that because it could have been absolute chaos. Yeah. Ridiculous. It might have been rubbish. <laughs> but you, when's the, when, when are you ever going to get the chance to rehearse in Mexico in your life ever again? Yeah. So that was on the cards, man. Yeah. But um, so, so do you have to, has he given you, I mean, you don't have to reveal set lists and stuff like that, but if there was new songs that you had to put in there, do you uh, do that in the sound checks or are you going to work on them at home beforehand? <clears throat> How do you get all working so tightly together uh, without a chance to actually um, be in the same room? Everybody, I suppose you have like a memory bank of mm. everything that could possibly be in there. But it won't just go in the set without having a, a run through with a sound check or yeah. something. And we've definitely rehearsed quite a bit of the new album. Um, and no one was even wanting to sound check them on the U2. Yeah, like, Ross said there was one song that he thought you might play on the on U2 yeah. torch. And, so, and, yeah. I, and I really like that because it's so not the days of not n y y nobody daring to do anything, you know, mm. like. In case anybody films it or finds out, or you know, and it all get, everything's everything's a bit or was a bit too precious like that. So Noel wanted to do new songs in the soundcheck. Just it was great, and we did do a couple, you know. Mm -hmm. But then the soundchecks didn't really happen in the end. Yeah, yeah you of know. Course. Right. Um, and how are the new songs transposing to a live environment? It's hard to say because we haven't played them live, but. But in the sound check, the it, more you do them, they right now I prefer playing them, yeah. You know, even though the, the old ones are great, oh, the old ones, listen to me, you know, like <laughs> his whatever he's on these previous albums, and the Oasis tunes are totally rearranged, yeah. So they, in, in, in a way, it's almost like he'd written them now, mm -hmm. I think, but the new ones are. They've got a different angle, especially yeah. guitar-wise as yeah. well, you know. Is there much guitar on the record? So as we record this now, we've only heard kind of three snippets of, of stuff that's come out. Is there a lot of guitar on the record? And if there's not, are you having to add some new stuff in there? Or there's um, It's weird because he's... There's, uh, it's not a guitar album, no. <clears throat> but there's a lot of guitars on there. Yeah. Um, and uh, live... Noel's always wanted, he, uh, always about, um, oh, when I put this, it's not about the details. It's not about making it like the record. He's, it, it's more the feeling, yeah. Um, which used to be, you know, it was. it, it wasn't about getting out every single nuance of what's on the record because sometimes they're not important yeah. they're important if you've got headphones on you know but when on you a put, beach when you, so we're, <laughs> in, we're in your little studio downstairs at the moment so you, would you put the stuff on in here and then pick out the guitar parts or did you speak to uh, to Noel and say this is how we want to approach it and with the record yeah with yeah, the record yeah um, I, I, he's great because I've, I've got all the parts nice you know like we're well, not all not everything's separated mm. but I could listen to just the guitars I could listen to just the bass mm -hmm. or just the strings or just, so that's great because you can you can get I don't know you can get the bonnet up a bit easier and have a, have a little look Whoa, well, oh right okay well that's two guitars doing that <laughs> or you know that's a, or like one one of the solos is Johnny Marr and once you get your head round that thing of 
because I didn't know that at first. And when I was learning it, <laughs> thinking, you know, what's this and everything. And when Noel of one rehearsal said, you know, I should be a bit fat sound and that and everything. And I didn't have the stems by then. Right. And then when he said, oh, I don't know what Johnny did. And then, and then it all fell into place because <laughs> it really is a Johnny kind of thing. Yeah. It's like a chordal based bit of whammy bar. Yeah. You know. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, and the guitars you're going to take out on the tour. So we saw you in, in Rome and... Um, Sounded great. The band was so tight. It was fantastic. Um, is that the, the is that the famous um, Gibson uh-huh. Firebird? Is that right? That is, that, that, that is my Oasis Firebird. Yeah. That is legendary. That but guitar. I don't. You don't is play, it? Yeah, man. Totally. You had that in the Go Let Out video. How much do you reckon I get for that? Oh man, <laughs> loads. <laughs> loads. Um, so yeah, yeah. So uh, like, how are you choosing which guitars to take out on tour? There's a story behind that, actually. Yeah, go on. Let's. I used to work in a guitar shop, but it was a pawnbroker's. Right. And we used to say, a guitar ain't a guitar till it's done a bit of bird, right? <laughs> and some people used to lose their guitars. Anyway, that belonged to a guy who ended up being a scriptwriter for Ali G. He lost it. Really? I got it, yeah. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. Wow, nice one. Anyway, just a little um, tangent. There. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, a, that's obviously <laughs> a beautiful guitar. How are you choosing the ones to take out on tour? Um, <clears throat> well, Noel's lent us a couple. He's got a mega um, Trini Lopez, Gibson Trini Lopez. Um, but really, it's like semis, strats, tellies. Mm-hmm. That's it. Um, and then, you know, you have to have a backup for each one. And the, and the main thing as well is there's a lot of capos going on. Yeah. A real lot. And um, you, you can mess around on one guitar with a cap, but it's best to have it capoed up yeah, before. and kept kind yeah. of around about that way yeah you know um so yeah i mean some songs they need the strat sound and like i don't know say riverman solo is mm. definitely a strat to me um but uh half the world away mm. is like a really clean kind of um not getting in the way kind of guitar sound but then you know some of them you need to kind of go that champagne supernova solo you couldn't just tinkle away on that yeah so it's trying to keep it basic and trying to keep it functional you're doing a good job man to say so, so you're right <laughs> that man. Makes sense i've seen you guys play in diff- <laughs> seen you guys playing different various forms over the years and i'll tell you what you sounded you guys sounded so tight that particular gig and uh yes it's all sounded really good um so you've got like a huge tour coming up in February, March and April, May, which I think is about 40 shows. Um, how are you feeling about going back on the road for long tours? Um, is touring a pressure we don't see from, for, you know, from a musician's point of view? Do you um, look forward to it? Or? No, it's great. Yeah. And, you know, these lot are all just top, really good fellas. And everybody does their thing, you know, it's great. But then there's just the other side of it of... It just been away, mm. and it, I. It depends on the kind of tour as well, because if you're on a bus, sleeping and all that kind of thing, it is different being mm. fifty doing that kind of shit. If you know what I mean. Yeah. But we're not. Yeah. Oh, we haven't been, and you hit the wall about three weeks, or I do, and then you kind of start, and then it all just comes back round. And this next bit is four weeks in South America. Oh, it's gonna be amazing. Yeah, it's it's bonkers, really. Are they all show supporting you too? The ones yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is talk of bits and pieces here and there, but that's always, always been the case. And um, it's, I don't know, a fluid, flexible kind of thing. If you know, you. I mean, we got we got four gigs in Sao Paulo, mm-hmm. which is it's it's, uh, it's mad, you know. But <laughs> yeah. I think we're there for twelve days. That's the other thing about this kind of size of two uh, days off. Yeah, they're harder. You know, it's kind of that thing of, yes, you'd, you'd, you'd rather play like every other night, Yeah, I reckon. But they've got such a big production that it has to shift yeah, from yeah, yeah, city yeah. to city, oh, and, city yeah, yeah. And, and you get the days off in the Mental. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're, they're so what cool. are you going to do? Are you just going to chill out in South Park? I mean, there's worse, worse places to be. Oh, of course <laughs> there is. Yeah, yeah, no, it's going to be great. And this, I mean, we, I'm going to Bogota for the first time, Right. which will, you know. I mean, Narcos. What else you yeah, 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 exactly. You know, yeah. By the way, I'm halfway through season three, so don't say anything. Okay, I've only finished <laughs> season two, so yeah, I'm right. no spoilers. Um, 
but is it easier now 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 your kids have grown up um, going on tour because i remember you once said that um when noel used to knock on your front door and oh. your boy would see him and he burst into tears because he knew that noel was taking you away yeah. uh, to go on tour and stuff like that is it easier now the kids have grown up yeah it's different i mean because they're adults you know and they wouldn't be here anyway if i was here yeah kind of thing you yeah. know but um no they and they're they're just brilliant because they're they're just like I'm. <clears throat> they're always going, oh, I'm really proud of you, you know. Oh, you know, so that's, you know, yeah. there's it's nothing really better take. than that, yeah. really. <laughs> first instrument you played, I believe, going back uh, years ago, it was a violin. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, it was. So, what um, what were you trying to achieve at that stage? Was it? Did you want to become a musician, or were you just trying to pick up skills that you might be able to use on the guitar? Like, I on, like... did not have a clue because it was at school, yeah. and they were giving us this test, and I I didn't know what it what the hell. Yeah. And then, and it was daft. I remember it was something like, right, two notes, beep, beep. Which one's the highest? You right. know, kind of thing, and um. Then they said, then this, somebody came in the class later and went, do these kids want to learn the violin? And I was like, what? <laughs> Didn't even know. So I was doing that and really I liked it, but it's almost impossible for me because I've got odd wrists. So how, how so? How do you mean? I can't touch my shoulders. Oh. Honestly. Why? What, what is it? They just, any... they just, they don't rotate. Oh, right, okay. So, hence, that's why I play with a thumb over the oh, top. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, oh, wow. So the violin was just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, And, but I really liked it, and I liked my teacher. Um, and he had a beard, played guitar, wore jeans, that kind of teacher. Great. Anyway, because of my wrist, they put me on the cello. Ah. I didn't like that teacher at all. He was a dick. <laughs> and he played piano or a tie. Mm. And when I wasn't liking it anymore, and I said I had a guitar by then, and I was wanting to do that, and me mum and dad, were, they were like, well, look, pack it in if you want. Um, but the teacher wouldn't let me pack it in. He was like, no, no, because I've had students who wanted to pack it in, and now they thank me because they're touring the world playing music. Oh, how <laughs> so I've always have a, <laughs> had a... I'm not making this shit up. That's exactly it. You know. Do you think there was specific? Was he right? Like, was there specific things you might have learned in that period, even though you didn't like him, that you ended up kind of shaping the way you played guitar? Or, or? he was probably right, man. And I was just a kid. You yeah. know, I was like just going, I'm not enjoying this, and I want to play the guitar. And whenever I used to pick up the guitar, me mum, <clears throat> me mum used to go, "You should be practicing your cello," <laughs> you know, kind of. Yeah. And he's like, "Oh." So as a kid, you're going, this is not... But I'm saying that I've had this with my kids, yeah. where Libby used to have piano lessons, and we sussed on that she was actually trying to learn the music without reading it, but faking reading it. <laughs> yeah, right, she was yeah. basically winging it. Yeah. And we were saying, you've got to kind of practice and all this. And she didn't like it, and she packed it in, so now she plays by ear. Or as we all do by YouTube. Yeah. So do you? Do you um, can you read music no, to a certain no. level? No. I know. I know the. You know the basic. I know the idea of it. Yeah. yeah. But um, no, not at all. I can read chords and things. Yeah. You know, and I know what. But you play piano, so if someone put a piece of music in front of you that was, uh, you know, could, could you read it? Um, no. It's a no, take, no, 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 no. But you haven't said that. That's what they say about self-taught. You kind of get the rough idea of it, and then you hit a wall, and then it could be a year later, you're over that wall, and you're mm. kind of like, oh, that's how you do that. I mean, honestly, even work years ago, working out they're doing octaves in the left hand, yeah. that was like a, uh, yeah. what? That's yeah. the, yeah, you know. Um, what were you trying to achieve when you know when you got the guitar and you, you, you said you always want to play guitar? What were your ambitions? What were you trying to achieve? Was it to were you thinking about like I want to be a, a musician as a career or anything like that, or was it escapism you were getting from it? What were you trying to achieve? What were your ambitions at that age? It's 
it's all wrapped up in initially just liking the idea of them and drawing them and you know but just really liking it and looking at pictures in the catalogue and all that kind of thing then just want to be in a band mm. that's it just want to be in a band and you're never thinking about making it or any of that stuff yeah. just sort of like want to be want to be in a band with your mates which is good because you you have your mates but then if you've got mates in a band it's I don't know it's a different kind of Hmm. It's a different kind of non aloneness mm. if that makes sense, you know. And then after that, then you, then you. I'm thinking now, like you're about thirteen or fourteen, yeah. And then you're thinking, well, we, we could we could get some gigs here and all that. And then before you know it, then you like, all right, we better write some songs. Mm. And then it all just goes on. But I'm, I'm, yeah. How did your family feel about you going into music? Did they did they want you to get a, a proper job in Inferno? No, not at then? all. They were just brilliant. But they were older when they had me, so it's different. Uh. It wasn't like... They were really just kind of happy for me, you know. And when you started playing gigs, like so the, the famous one I heard about, um, was it the band called The Contenders you played? Yeah. Is that right? So... Kentish Town, yeah, yeah. Bull and Gate. Yeah. So I'm sat alongside Steve, right? Our band headlined the Friday night at Bull and Gate, and we thought we were going to make it. We never fucking did. <laughs> but I hear this particular show, because it was like a kind of a, on the way up, like London playing that gig was such a big <laughs> deal for us. And you guys played the same uh, slot, but is it right you were dressed in a boiler suit? Well, <laughs> I can't remember, but um, quite possibly. No, I'll tell you what it'll be, because I worked there for two years. Really? I was the stage manager. Wait, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. So, Have you seen it now? Ah uh, oh, no, not for years. Mm -hmm. It's but changed quite a lot. It's but... changed a lot because yeah. it used to be Pat and Margaret who had the pub, right? Okay, Irish couple, great, all that, and they were just you know a normal North London boozer. But John Beast had the back room, but he used to do a thing called the Time Box, and I think it was in Kennington as well, right, something. Okay. And that, but then he changed it into Hype, okay, and Hype then became this kind of, I mean. Talk about fucking concept. He he had me doing day glow signs to make it look like a kind mm. of uh, like a supermarket and everything. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And roller painting the floor with the logo and everything was barcoded. And we had we wore white boiler suits with hype <laughs> on the back. And it was like this kind oh. of you know that was the vibe of it. And um, but yeah, and it was it was my job to go right. You've got one more song. Hurry up. Really? All right. <laughs> what are your fondest memories of playing gigs around that time? So before it really took off and you became, you know, a professional musician, that kind of thing. What are your fondest memories around that time? Um, well, you know, just them kind of, I mean, especially gigs like The Falcon, which was on the level of the Bull and Gate kind of thing, mm. but worse. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, it was just about you were basically plenty of mates, yeah, and, and so it was it was just good crack, yeah. But you know you are talking about you know carrying your own gear, loading vans after the gig, dropping it in somebody's hall, that mm. kind of thing. So it's it's it's, not, it's hardly a night out, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, you know. But yeah, Only but before that, even when I lived up north, we used to come to London and play gigs, yeah. You know, do the, I mean. All the old gigs, like the old Marquee. Yeah. And the Hundred Club and the Ad Lib. They're still going, they're still going, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, them kind of. Yeah. So, so how did, what was the journey from when the, it was kind of playing to your mates to, you know, getting in heavy, heavy stereo and you were signed by McGee, is that right? Yeah. So what's that connection? How did it go from A to B? Well, um, I was in a band, three-piece band from the north, contenders and that ended up being a two-piece band so we started using samplers and that and cubase and that really old way and we had like an eight track mm -hmm. tape machine that was synced up and like s900s 850s i think in 
I think when the S1100 came out, it was like, what, this mm. Rolls Royce machine kind of thing. So we'd, we were working like that and we got a deal with Food Records All right. and did an album, but it just, it, it never, it was never right, never pleased everybody and it just didn't come out. Mm. And so from that, having a band that was all about floppy discs and loading the sampler and all that kind of thing mm. was heavy stereo, which was the complete opposite, which yeah. was just guitar based drums and kind of making it more robust or whatever. And through that, we signed to creation and that's when you start doing different gigs, you know, and what are your fondest memories of the time in that particular band? Because that must be such an exciting part of yeah, your life. Yeah, yeah. That must have been the time where you thought, fuck, this, this could happen. Oh, you know, man, uh, amazing. Because the first deal didn't work out. And with youth, you kind of just dust yourself down, mm. you know. And then with creation, because there was other companies wanting to sign us as well. Um, but we just felt, no, creation is, is uh, you know, not... It was just the label, yeah, you yeah. know, and we liked all the bands anyway, and it was just this feeling of wow, now we now we're getting some traction here. And so, did you did you approach them? Were you send them, a, uh, you know, tapes and stuff like that, or did they come to one of your gigs? Or was the, there... the first we put tapes out because I was signed to EMI Publishing, I think. Right, and um, I can't remember, who, but anyway, um, Creation heard of us, and there was a guy called Mark Bowen, who now is a Wichita right. label, which is Dick Green's label. Right, Because okay. it was Dick Green and Al McGee. Oh, right. And Dick Green's got... Anyway, it was Mark Bowen who came and saw us at Harlow Square. Oh, you yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. I, think it, I think it might have been Harlow No, I'll tell you what. Now he came to see us somewhere else. Yeah. And then he brought McGee and a few people to Harlow Square. Yeah. A lot of good bands played that venue. Yeah, yeah. Well, Because you know, I'm now thinking, cause it was a different era of... I mean, Bedford Squires. Yeah. And then kind of satellite kind of gigs and yeah. so yeah Bedford Esquires McGee comes and basically said that night uh, I want to sign the band he said a couple of other things obviously he knows what he's doing because yeah. he actually said let's get Jimmy Page to produce the album which of course wow. you just go fucking <laughs> bring it on but um, you know and then that was that why did he say that? Was that to kind of like get got you up so you could sign I the would deal? say that to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or any, you know, come on. But it's, it's, that's, that's the other way of... That's the record industry you want to be in, isn't it? You know? <laughs> so that album, Deja Voodoo, there's some, so I was listening to it this morning. I had so many good tunes on there. Chinese Burn, what an absolute tune yeah. that was. Um, how did you feel writing that, knowing that it was like... It was a big record deal that you just got. Like, did you... N knowing you had that expectation that it was going to be put out on a good label, did it change the way you approached your writing in any way, even subconsciously? Um, mm, no, I think, really, you just, I think going about that headspace, you want to be able to play them live. Yeah. It's not about, it certainly wasn't about making you know, some artistic statement mm -hmm. as such and um, and just get moving, really. But yeah, the only thing that slightly affects your writing, I suppose, is a publishing deal. Because suddenly you're actually officially getting paid for it, which is weird. <laughs> How does it affect you? <laughs> well, then you kind of, you're not just thinking of... Well, well, you get a check and then you're going, right, so obviously now the next one I write, it better be good. And th that's not how it works. Mm. And you just got to keep going. Yeah. Um, you've spoken in the past that the material you were working on, you were really, really proud of um, uh, with Heavy Stereo. It was, and that was at the point where Noel asked you to join. Um, whatever happened to that particular material you were writing that never got... Uh, was never uh, used under the name Heavy Stereo. Was that the pool of songs you kind of went to when Noel asked you to write an Oasis? Um, well, the roller was around from them times. Really? Is yeah, it yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, yeah. Because it was just a, a, a tune that you could play on anything, really. Yeah. Um, but it certainly didn't sound like how it ended up sounding like with BDI. Yeah. But I remember doing a demo 
in Oasis times and Noel saying that's a fucking single. Yeah, he and once said that that will go number one. He said, I think. Yeah, yeah, said, it was yeah. something like I can't yeah. really remember, but um, it was some songs that just start to get in the box. You How? know, it like it was, it was always better as like a campfirey kind of demo. Yeah, and getting it together with the rest of the sounds didn't work in Oasis. How specifically? How does it differ? So that version that you did, the ones you kind of did, like I, I read that you tried it out a few times. The role of it, it yeah. might have only been that. But how specifically did it differ? If you were to listen to the two versions, because it's obviously never been heard. How did it differ to the BDI version? What the the, the production? The first the one. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Oh man! Or the different Oasis versions. Like how how are they acoustic? Are they quite rocky? How there they wasn't really a finished Oasis version. Right. Okay. Oh, I'd have it in my iTunes, man. Um, yeah. Getting the rhythm for me. It's quite a weird hi at the mm-hmm. thingy. You know what? When I when I wrote it, I had Danny Supergrass in my head for that kind of beat. What Danny Goffey? Yeah. He was our last guest on the last Was episode. he? Yeah. But do you know that kind of thing? Yeah, he's That's good trying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sort of just sort of thinking out loud now yeah. but yeah so but it was it wasn't like there was a pool of songs it was like unfinished bits and things you know and one, one question I've got for you in regards to when you joined Oasis so like but like hey you know in your um, introduction you yeah. said something about the quiet ones yeah because we did release that didn't we yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Side, I yeah, thought so side, yeah yeah but I wrote that for George Harrison simple as that really because he's the quiet one Ah. And I played it to his missus. Really? Yeah, because she was at Wheeler End. Oh, wow. Because she used to know Suzanne and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of, I was trying to put that George Weird chord in. Yeah. You know, that's all, you know, so let's hear it for the quiet, the quiet ones. ones. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> As in, because he just died. Right. That's it. Oh, man. <laughs> so that was written, so if he just died, so that was written well before you joined Oasis then, right? So yeah. you've written that for Heavy Stereo? Or? I just rem- actually, no, I might have been just in Oasis. Because okay. I remember it was in the old, old house. I wrote it in the kitchen. So let's hear it For the quiet ones Can't get near it So a bright and sound And when you recorded that and released that, that was, it sounded like it was something that maybe just you, Andy and um, Liam did. When you were doing songs like that, did, did Noel have, did he kind of just leave you to it and say you can release it under the Oasis name? Uh, or did he have a real control over how those songs were going to sound? Did he? No, just, he was a bit of both, really. Yeah. And did you have to run it past him, though, like before it got released? Like, did he want to hear um, it? And did he want to make tweaks to it? He was all, he was, I mean, from day one, he was always, have you got any tunes? Mm. It's both me and Andy, and really open about it. Did that surprise you? Yeah, actually. Well, everything was surprising at the time. <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't know, you know, what was happening, if you know what I mean. Because he just joined this band who were like, you know, as my uncle put it, it's like joining the Rolling Stones, man, you know, and yeah. you kind of. I can see it from his viewpoint in a good way. Um, but we used to do demos, weird demos on a lot of studios and put them on a CD yeah. and go and listen on the boombox. I mean, God, it sounds like the dark ages now, doesn't it? There's some great stuff you've got <laughs> out it, it recorded that way. Um, and when you joined Oasis, obviously Noel gave you a call. I don't think there was an audition, was there? No, he'd, he'd obviously no, no. already seen you play yeah, the yeah. stereo gigs yeah, yeah. and stuff like that yeah. and gave, gave you the shout. Um, and we'd support Oasis. Oh, OK, right, yeah, OK. So yeah, yeah. You, you but he had come to see us a few times. Yeah. Did you... Um, so was your first day on the job of Go Let It Out video? Yeah. Oh, yeah so had yeah, you had yeah, any yeah. rehearsals then? Because you didn't have a bassist then because Noel's playing bass in the video, right? So Andy hadn't even joined by then. Um, look, I can't remember the <laughs> exact timeline, but we definitely played together. But we were auditioning bassists, you know. Yeah. We were going through a few. We must have played before then, without a shadow of a doubt. But that was the first video shoot. And it was all them days of, like, the sun were in the bushes and, yeah, you know, them yeah. kind of things. And it was this new fella and all that. 
and the first day was a complete and utter washout. Like, Why? Rain. Drain, rain. Yeah, like, yeah. Out dripping. Bit, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I remember Noel going, this is not happening, man. Um, and saying something about insurance and blah, 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 blah. And just like, right, we're doing it again. And I was like, wow, that's, 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 that's the way to do shit. You yeah. know? So it was better weather the next day. I think it was a couple of shots cut in where we dressed up in big black parkers and yeah, all that. Right. But it was just a bit of a trippy time because, yeah, it was... Whitey, Whitey on drums, yeah. And Liam was playing acoustic guitar. Liam was playing acoustic, yes. That's right, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. strumming an E chord all the way through. I know, oh, I hadn't told him that today. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Um, yeah that's, that's, that's classic. And um, were you at the uh, auditions for the bassist? Like, did you have a say in Andy Bell or anything like that? Or was yeah, yeah, yeah. It, oh, right, um, okay. Did all the auditions with all of them, and you yeah. kind of... It's weird because... You can tell straight away, and there's a couple that were good and all this, but not. But we had the gigs in America coming up, yeah. and it was like we need somebody. And there was one guy going to get it, I think. There was a few loons came down, you know. One you guy, one names, guy. Was it? I like, can't remember the names actually, yeah. but I remember. No, I honestly can't. Yeah. Well, this guy Potsy yeah, from I've Manchester. Heard. He was nearly. He, he was nearly me. nearly the guy. But there was another guy came, and he just got completely pissed. And actually said to know if I was you, I wouldn't give me the job. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. What a job interview. <laughs> I know. But it was a bit of that. I'd remember that week of we'd have to, you know, you'd be mixing and stuff, and then it'd be like curry, and it'd be like curry in Guinness, and there was a lot, you know. Liam wasn't drinking then. Yeah. And it was, and yeah, some guys were obviously shooting themselves out the cannon, but um, then. And everybody's probably heard this story, but we were driving out the Wheeler End and Liam and Noel were talking about, hey, have you heard Andy Bell's joined Gay Dad? Mm -hmm. We can't have that. What about him? And then that was it. Yeah. And he came and he'd learned everything just brilliantly. But Noel said, no, it's too, it's too like the record. Like, so you know what I was saying wow. earlier about keep, so he didn't want Wonderwall like, he, he mm. wanted it yeah. heavier and how everything is yeah. with that sort of you know that approach didn't want it all musoy. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. that Andy's a musoy. he just yeah. learned it properly yeah, yeah. you know um, when you joined Oasis how long did you think it was going to last? And the reason I say that is there was a lot of people expected at the time that you do the Stand on the Shoulders of Giants tour, then break up. So much so that, like, so you guys, your last gig of those tours was the Reading and Leeds Festival. We played Reading on my, actually, my 18th birthday. Two oh, days wow. later, Lee, you play Leeds, and I walked out on stage and went, this is not the funeral. It was that, it was that talked about that much. That it he was told like, us to do that, but not didn't tell us, but he went, right, when we go on, everybody walk the front of the stage. I didn't have a clue what he was going to say. Right. So you're kind of going, oh, fuck. What? Is this the fucking Ziggy moment? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so throughout that time, I mean, we're going to get to the point where, I mean, he left the tour at one point and stuff like that. Like, how honestly, honestly, how long did you think it was going to last? Did you think you were going to be in the band for years or do you think this is going to be a year or so and that's it? Uh, honestly, especially from that first tour, thinking this could end at any minute really or it could go for 25 years that kind of thinking and um it was volatile i mean well look no left the tour that first tour our first mine and andy's first tour yeah left the tour but would come back and then go and so it was just this i said at the time it probably did me a lot of good because i had to learn all these parts in 24 hours yeah ridiculous like something ridiculous like that. I remember thinking, have I done the right thing here by saying I can do this, you know, on really? many levels. Because, you know, it's Noel's yeah. band. It's Noel's sound. It's Noel's... And what are people going to think, you know, let alone can I do it? But it was... it was. You'd now, it, it, I mean... You... It was heavy to do, but to yeah. come through was just like, wow, okay. And... It's not that I steadied the ship, but the ship steadied, so it wasn't just like the band's over. Mm. But and Matt Dayton, had you played with him before? No, nope. never wow. met him. 
So he learned. He said he learned his songs on the literally on the plane on the way over. So the parts. I'm guessing you said to him, "Will you play the rhythm and I'll play the lead." It was Whitey who oh, he said because it. he knew him through Mother Earth, I think, in his brother and that kind of thing in Weller and yeah. stuff. But um, I think it was sort of assumed that. I would do the Noel stuff mm -hmm. and he would do my stuff. Even though me and Noel used to chop it up a little yeah. bit. Well, I'd do a riff and he would do the solo on. And, and it was a little bit of a... How did you... It's like, it was a bit of a... To, to use a Noel line, it's a Jedi mind trick <laughs> of... Right, so I'm playing the intro on this one, but usually I'd wait to come in. Mm. But now I'm doing the solo. And... It, it got ridiculous because you'd have an A and a B rig because, you, you know, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, want to be being set up in Europe yeah. and want to be in, like, literally the stadium. And right, all. yeah. But Spooner, my guitar guy, would say, right, so is this, is it the A band with the B rig or <laughs> is it the B band with the B, is it the A, you know, because, yeah. you know, he was he was basically doing me when Noel was there and Matt, I think, I can't remember, man. <laughs> but it was, yeah, I mean, it shows you, you guys are under, like, you were under crazy pressure to have to learn all that, that, that's, that, that uh, those parts in such a short period of time. Like, breaking it down, if you're, again, so let's so take it out the fact that it was a massive stadium band that you were playing in. If you're a young musician, it's like you've got 24 hours to learn those parts. Yeah. But how did you break that down? Because um, they were live versions, and I'm guessing, would you yeah, be yeah. able to get live versions that you played already on the tour and learn them from that, or was it just from knowing? I had them on a dictaphone, we, I don't know how. But I, a semi acoustic in a hotel room, I don't know where we were. I can't, I can't remember when Noel left. Barcelona. Was it Barcelona? Yeah. Right, oh right, okay. So I was in a hotel in Barcelona, I think, learning them, but all just quiet, you know, like no amp or anything. But we were driving to, I wanna say somewhere like Vienna, to meet Matt to rehearse, mm. I think. Oh man, I can't remember. But it was it was this whole thing. So I remember being on the bus and learning it and thinking, right, I got. But then it's a whole different thing when you're plugged in, mm. and then you got to play it, you know, and playing through Noel's amps as well, and that kind of. So he left his equipment for you to use. Yeah, 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 oh. yeah, yeah. Wow, man, that's I a lot mean, of pressure you went through on that time. Yeah. Um, but that's what you do, isn't it? You don't flake, I suppose. Given you spent uh, most of your life up to that point uh, before joining the races, you're writing songs for yourself to sing. Um, what were the specific impacts on the creative process now you're writing for someone else? Other than key changes. Hmm. <laughs> Just, do I like it? And then, can I hear Liam singing it? Mm. That's... It's, I think, yeah, just like, because you're already in the mindset, I suppose. You're in the band, you're doing them gigs, you're playing them songs, and you're not, I suppose, going to put forward some daft 15-minute <laughs> piano opus, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. So you're writing for... Oasis, weren't you? I suppose, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And you pick up on the vibe of what everybody else is on as well. Yeah. Like when you're doing demos and you kind of get this thing unspoken, really. And just, just different phases. Sometimes it might be just a kind of rattly acoustic phase. Or what you're listening to, Yeah. Because there used to be big phases as well of 
we'd be listening to a lot of Neil Young mm. in the dressing room or a lot of Peter Green. All them kind of times. Yeah. I think now and you know, Pink Floyd, which I found surprising at first, mm. uh, initially thinking, oh, wow. Because I didn't know them, know them, know them. Yeah. You know, so you... But obviously, you know, they're not just going to walk around just listening to the Pistols and the Beatles, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and is that how Hey Hey My Mind came to the set, listening to, to Neil, yeah. Neil Young? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always just envisage that just you and Noel just going, oh, I fucking love that song. Should we do it? Yeah, let's do it. Like, oh, man, it was all that kind of banter of, you know, Noel would say, have you heard the creation do how do you how does it feel to feel and me going no and then playing it and just going how the hell have I not heard this in my yeah. life things like that yeah you know and then Andy going yeah Ride used to do this <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you remember about writing Hung in a Bad Place I remember where I was when I first heard that you played at the Royal Albert Hall and oh, wow. I remember it was so good I'm not just blowing smoke up you but it was such a, <laughs> so powerful that it was like I was still thinking about it afterwards and you'd already just started Slide Away and I was like, it was oh. like a verse in Slide. I was like, fuck, they're playing Slide Away. <laughs> like, oh, wow. I was like, it was so powerful, it was so good. Love that tune, Hung in the Bad Place. Yeah, what do you remember about I writing like, that? Well, uh, I remember, because I like that kind of lyric. It's just having fun with it. Mm. And I suppose it's because I really used to like the kind of Chuck Berry way of coming at it. Which and is? through that, well, they're just perfect. I mm. mean, like, you know, the way the syllables and the phrases are, but then I really like, I like the human hung in a bad place, but I used to really like the Ramones a hell of mm. a lot. And I used to put the two together of the way, I mean, when I used to think, like, like, tune out a rhythm on my bubble gum, the sun is out and I want some. Mm could be a Chuck Berry lyric. Yeah. And so it there's a bit of that I think in Hung in About and I think yeah. I'll get Tarzan in there as well. Yeah. And all that and I just, Tarzan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember. And monkeys and But yeah, you know, so it's that kind of Because eyeball tickler's a bit like that. Yeah, well, yeah. Because, that's why I, I yeah. have that sort of thing of that yeah. making fun with words, I suppose. But the syllables of hung when you're singing it as well, it's just one of them notes when I was writing it, you can really belt. Mm. It's it's, and you know I don't. Hey man, I'm not one of those to analyze it, but I like it. I've been hung in a bad. Is it? I've been hung in a bad place for too long. Yeah, and that kind of says enough. <laughs> <laughs> Songs like Eyeball Tickler, I mean, Eyeball Tickler to me sounds like the soundtrack to a riot. It's fucking, it's like, it's yeah, fucking yeah. amazing. Do you think when you write, your, when you were writing Oasis, did the music convey a different side to you than you did in previous songs? Like, were, were you angry at anything? Were you, like, what were you channeling when writing those kind of songs? Because they didn't... Eyeball Tickler's probably more to do with that, the feel of the riff. Yeah. And just trying to be mm -hmm. livid, not livid, not angry, kind of just vicious. Yeah. And it's a bit daft, I think, as well. Like, ding, 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 ding. I don't know. I, I don't know. So, I can't even remember the lyrics for Eyeball Tickler, but even just the title. What does it mean? I th I'd have to know what the verses are, but it's probably, I'm thinking, something that gets you off, something that amuses you, you know. It, it, I don't know. If it tickles your eyeballs, yeah, maybe. I yeah. don't know. You tell me. <laughs> it's a good song. It's a good piece. It's a, it's a tune, that one. Um, you worked a lot with Liam and developed Liam's songwriting. Um, 
what were your fondest memories working on his early songs? Because like Songbird, there's an amazing version of Songbird, which is full band, and you're, I guess it's you playing harmonica on it, and it's absolutely brilliant. A harmonica? And you, yeah, there's a harmonica all the way through. Is there? Yeah, yeah, man, it's you really sure? good. Yeah. So it's, it's got, not a harmonium? The, no, well, okay. We'll, oh. we'll, we'll, we'll put it up in a minute. I don't know, okay. It. Yeah, and um, there's like the bass line all the way through. Like, it's like, it's really, really Songbird. high bass line. Songbird, there's a wow. full band version of it. Full band. I forgot what the hell's was going on Yeah, <laughs> and, um, and obviously it didn't end up like that. It was like very acoustic right, yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. Um, did you experiment a lot in the early days with Liam's songwriting and trying to, how, how did you kind of uh, get it out of him? Because Well, uh, we used to demo a lot and he would always be writing, always in his warm up room, but always just bits. Um, uh, I remember once, because I used to have an eight track port studio, I remember hiring a car and me and him driving out the Wheeler End and just plugging the port studio in but using all the gear. So instead of using the studio, and I think that was the first time we did something together like working on a song. Mm. And I mean, I wouldn't be giving him advice or anything. It was just. I think I used to say that's how everybody does it. They just. They wait for the next bit and it'll come. And that did happen with a few songs, a few of his songs. <coughs> um, uh, like I would say, like, Happiness is a Warm Gun is obviously bits. Yeah. They haven't just started at the front and <laughs> gone to the end. Three and bits. So, three, and, yeah. and I think, I can't remember what which of his songs, but he would wait for, like, the chorus to come and then he'd get it and then he would know. See, Born on a Different Cloud always sounded like that. Yeah, a different that's song the same. Together. Yeah, yeah, I think that was one of those. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, he was just because he's pretty unorthodox. He 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 kind of makes his own chords up, mm. and then you kind of kind of work. Oh, all right, it's a D with a finger on, or you know. And he doesn't play anybody else's songs. I've mm. never heard him play anybody else's song ever. Really? Yeah. Which is, I mean, I'm not saying he's doing it to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing, you know. But he, you know, people normally will learn a lot. I'm still doing it now. Mm. I mean, I saw I was playing snook with my mate last night, and I was talking about the genius of all the young dudes. Yeah. And we've all heard that song a million yeah. times. Yeah. But we were just, I was saying. Right, so you get this set up with the, the verse chords, and you're like, "Wow, this is this is it's something." But then it takes you somewhere else, and then it comes back with the verse chords for the chorus, and you're like, "Right, oh yeah, familiar." To, well, hang on, whoa, what's that chord just <laughs> done? It's like a trapdoor chord. Yeah, and Bowie did that a lot. Yeah. yeah, so that kind of unpicking, Liam doesn't do. Mm never has but that's natural to him yeah you know what can you tell us about the death in vegas sessions because i think you did velvet building which ended up becoming flick of the finger is that right uh, I th uh, you have said that in an interview before but it might be i can't I, I, yeah i'm now nah, anyway I think he had that melody for a long time, which was just a na 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 kind of thing. Um, but I can't remember doing it in Cornwall. But the thing about the Death in, Death in Vegas thing was, it was a uh, it was a concept as you as you as you have, and no one wanted to go to sawmills because that's where they yeah. recorded a lot of definitely maybe yeah, I think right, yeah. and. Um, but it's just not one of those. It's a, it's a, it's a good idea on paper, mm. but it just didn't. It wasn't right. It was too claustrophobic, and um, we had Terry on drums, who Kirk plays Kirkbride. Kirkbride, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Um, and the way Death in Vegas work, like Fearless, is just. He's like a a vibe man, mad head, getting all things. But he had an engineer who just seemed to take 
forever and we're not the mm. most patient band at all or weren't at all and it was just too slow and we felt like we were on the dole like literally just watching telly all day while he, he's got something ready to play so that's why it didn't work out how much stuff did you do like how much of an album did you a do whole album I think Fuck more me. more or less I think I used to have it <laughs> but then we went to America and just spent like three months in LA in Capital yeah so it's talk about the opposite yeah <laughs> what, what, what sort are there any like hidden gems that haven't been heard no, of that material. No, no, no. Did any of that stuff get used again then in, in, in America? Like, did you re-record those We songs? re-recorded stuff, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. And we had Zach, and yeah. it was a whole different feeling. And, um, but yeah, nothing was kept. <clears throat> nothing at all. On that subject, what what's the best Oasis song no one's ever heard? Whoa, can't ask me a question like that, man, at this time. <laughs> um... The best Oasis song no one's ever heard. Or yet to so hear. that's so that's is that sort of assuming I've heard it. Yeah. No, I haven't heard anything that's No no, but what I mean yeah. is is like is there anything you recorded that you didn't release? Yeah. You're like, oh, uh, I fucking love that. That's a shame we didn't put that out. No. Nothing. Um Hmm. No, because even if it wasn't good, it wouldn't get finished. It mm. wasn't like there was, you know, like an alternative anthology version of an album. No would write a bunch of songs. And then you'd record them, and then that'd be it. And then you'd put forward yours, and then maybe they'd make the the cut. And obviously, songs maybe hung over a bit, like because Snow was. I demoed like quite a lot of his first album when we were still Oasis yeah. with him. You did Freaky Teeth and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. So it was. Yeah. So I'm just thinking now. There's that, but they've they're they're done. They're on record and they're out. Yeah. So did you know that was? Did you think they were going to be an Oasis song? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I didn't. I wasn't. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of person to go. Mm. Oh, this is an offshoot project in the yeah. making and all that. No, it was just these new bunch, and we were mixing, and I wanted to learn Pro Tools, so two things at once. Well, let's go and buy a drum kit, which we did, and I had a laptop, and I was learning how to work it mm. by going into the mixing room and go. Well, how do I do? And what's this? And then, and then this guy Ryan, who was brilliant, mm -hmm. just really showed me a few things. And so, what best way to learn than to record some songs? Yeah. And there were no five and old tunes. Wow. Yeah. So, what stuff has been recorded? So, we're sat in your studio at the moment, and there's some classic stuff here. We've got is that from Ringo? Is that a snare sign to you from Ringo? So, snare yeah, from man. Ringo. Some great photos you got. Oh, they, are they the Brit? So what's the middle thing? Is that the. No, it's not Brit Award. That's a. No, it's a Brat Award. I Brat think, Award. From the or enemy. Oh, the enemy, that's it. And enemy. That stuff. Every study and Oasis. Yeah. Um, so, what's been recorded in here, in this very room? What magic has been recorded in here? Uh, quite a lot of BDI stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did Liam ever do his vocals in here? Yeah, look, that's his fingerprints. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so that's stretching, standing up, stretching, getting ready for it, yeah? Yep. Fucking hell, so he's recorded all his vocals in here. Wow. Oh, a lot of them, wow. Well, yeah. Um, and then we, you know, because uh, now in this day and age, everything is usable. Everything. You can record stuff on your phone, yeah. and it could end up on a record. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's great. So... We would do, yeah, we did some B-sides here, um, um, uh, yeah, and I've, and I've recorded with quite a few of my mates, I did, mm. uh, you know, Jay Mailer, yeah, he's who's now playing now with Liam, him. Yeah. Um, he recorded a song in here that is a belter, really? it's just outrageously good, and it's just voice and piano. Really? Yeah. Has it ever heard the light? No, he, he, he won't do anything. And I'm just like, Jay, it's incredible. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow, maybe we'll yeah, yeah. hear it one day. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, there's tons that's been said about Liam Knowles' relationship that, you know, that, that can be another. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forgetting their brotherhood for a moment, I wonder what your fondest memory of seeing them working together as musicians in the studio? 
Um, Lords, man. I mean, um, playbacks. When you, you know, it's always a good thing when it's all done, like a nighttime thing. Um, but you know what? They, they wouldn't really get in each other's faces recording as such. Like, no one wouldn't be sat listening to Liam sing in the vocal booth. Mm. He'd let him get on with it. Yeah. Um, it was all... You know, it was all good. It wasn't... I mean, it's a serious thing. You're making a record, so you're kind of focused on that. It's not a party time at all. It yeah. wasn't like that vibe. Yeah. No. But, um, yeah, there's not what, there's not really one thing where I go, oh, yeah, it was the moment when he did the vocal on that and Noel went and gave him a big hug. Yeah. No, it wasn't that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you or, or Noel d did something and Liam would be like, I mean, you know, they were, they, they, they were both fuck. They dug each other. They were both proud, but they all also want to kill each other. I suppose. Yeah. Proud of each other. I mean, not proud of themselves. You know. Yeah. They weren't proud of each other. Words, eh? How did you feel? You know, you once described as the rock upon which Oasis was built. How did you feel being the not kind of built? The surely, come on. Yeah, that's, that's on like your website. Like, that's nice, wow. yeah. But you know, you um, you you were kind of very kind of a mainstay during that time in regards to like having to be neutral and kind of in between. Um, that must have been such a challenge, you know, like in any work environment, working with brothers who are kind of at each other sometimes. Um, let alone being one of the biggest bands in the world. Was that a challenge? I mean, being in between the two of them and kind of always remaining neutral and and. Letting them sort their own stuff out? Um, well, it was never really a case of... Um, so, so when you say neutral, you know, you've got your opinion, Andy's got his opinion, yeah. you've got your vibe, but then it's not like... And, and it, it, there was ever a show of hands to raise yeah. a kind of, you know, to do a thing, like whatever. Um, but I'm, I like to be calm, mm. you know, rather than get involved in anything that will get sorted anyway, you know. So it's not like I'm, I don't know, really. It's just sort of, and Andy's calm. He's really calm. Yeah. So... We'll never know how it would have been if we were volatile <laughs> and added to it, you know, that whole thing. Um, Maybe you guys were the glue that kept it stuck. Like, well, stick together I, I, think, I think basically we didn't hinder it, yeah. you know, in making it kind of all out of proportion or whatever, because there was definite things that were going on that you didn't understand and you'd never understand because it is, it's blood. And and also, Noel knows what the fuck he's doing, mm. and he's he's it's and he's steering it, and it's right, yeah. you know, which obviously rubs Liam up the wrong way <laughs> as well, but you know, it's not it's not even a case of being okay with that, like as in say me or Andy, it's like well that's how it is, mm. and that's how all bands are, yeah. What you what know, it's it? weird to kind of unpick a dynamic because yeah. I just see it as that. Yeah. If, yeah, if that's helpful. <laughs> what happened? What happened? With Alan White is he still about? Is he still playing drums? I is haven't he... seen Whitey for years, really? man. Good no, drummer, no, no. man. Yeah, 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 we, definitely, we... man. I don't know if he's drumming so much. You, you, we would know, wouldn't yeah. we? Yeah. Oasis song because he never played live and you would love to. I'm probably going to say something and then I'll, I'll find out it. we have played it live. But <laughs> hey, the first one, Hey Now. 
Yeah, no, that's never been Have we never done... Right, never see, that's, I love that song. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. And it's kind of like a little bit of a... I don't know what you'd call it, but, like, it doesn't get the... The, yeah. the, the sort of... Respect, oh, not not respect, but you know, it's it's sort of it's on so it's, many different. It's overlooked. It's overlooked, but it's yeah. surrounded by so many great songs of that album. Yeah, yeah you know? true, actually. Yeah, man. Um, have you ever heard of Snake Bite? The song Oasis song Snake Bite. No. Oh my! I thought you actually said, "Have you ever had a snake no, bite?" No, no, no. I've just got chills. Yeah. <laughs> no, mate, that is such a tune. You got you, you one day mention it to I've Never even heard of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's before they did they definitely maybe, and it's instrumental, and it's just amazing guitar riffs and like solos all right. the way through two guitars going at the same time uh, playing it like playing off each other it's kind of I always think fucking in the bushes was a little bit influenced by it um, but it may, might not have been but um, right. you should check that out man okay. Snake Bite's yeah, an amazing yeah. song as a guitarist you, you might be interested to hear um, so funniest moment in the studio with Oasis oh man it's got to be a few well depends what you call funny <laughs> <laughs> um You know, I'm just flicking through different memories now, and <sighs> right. So this is obviously it's a name drop and it's all that kind of thing, but it was great, but it was kind of funny, but it's not. It I uh, look. I might as well just tell you because I'm not a comedian, Go on. so I don't have a. <laughs> I don't have a <laughs> but we're in LA. Yeah in capital and Noel wasn't there yet because he had a problem with his visa or something weird like that and we were recording for about a week but we knew McCartney was coming in mm. and he was recording the Super Bowl bit anyway we're just there and I look around one day and he's just sat on a chair in the back of the room <laughs> and it's like, but he it was alright because I'd never met him before but and he was totally cool yeah couldn't have been cooler and obviously you knew Zach and that helped it all and course, everything yeah. and you know but we had a few boxes of CDs all around the room and um, we'd been given them by Capital and I don't know what but they were all John Lennon and really? Macca went and had a quick look in and he was and he, he stopped really <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know oh, that's how I kind of just answer that question there. It's not the most hilarious anecdote, but it was pretty no, funny that you've it's got surreal. it. Well, it's normal as well, isn't it? Going, oh, what are they listening to? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> awkward. Absolutely not planned. And by the way, and he was, he was, he was funny. And and I'm recording my guitar. Eleven o'clock at night, sat facing the desk. He tapped me shoulder. And it's Macker in a hoodie, going, "Nice to meet you. See you later." And all oh, that. You nice. know, he didn't have to do that. He'd come in because he was getting off. Yeah, top man. Um. You play a beautiful kind of uh, accompaniment of Don't Back in Anger. There's like the acoustic version. I know you're doing it on this current tour at the moment, but you did it with Oasis too. And it's an absolute masterclass, in my opinion, in like kind of um, like accompanying a song, just doing what's needed. It might yeah. be. Do you know Desolation Row by uh, Bob Dylan? It's yeah, like the last track. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's almost like the call and response, like the lines yeah. sung and you kind of. Um, when you when you when you play songs like that um, and you change the arrangement, is that are you given kind of freedom by Noel to do whatever you want, or does he give you an idea that we're doing it acoustically? Can you play less, or you know how does that um, work? He, I mean, with that one, he was, I think he was wanting the solo to be like, like a crying, sighing kind of thing, mm. and that's what he'll say, and and he's totally cool. Like, really, with... Say if I'll go, yeah, because, you know, I don't, it, it could get a bit slash, and we'll use that, yeah. usually, or, you know, stuff like that. But... Um, it's taking notes out, isn't it? You've taken a lot of notes out. Yeah, so, and, yeah. And, and... Especially if it's acoustic, y y the more you leave out, the better, if yeah. you know what I mean, because then when you do play, it means something. And also, that song... Well, that solo is as big a it, Noel solo is mm. as big a part of the song as yeah. as anything else as well. Yeah, you know. So that's and you, you know, it's in an acoustic setting. Apart from it's in a different key. Yeah, you, you don't. I wouldn't want to do Noel solo because it's Noel solo. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, you know, it's. But um, yeah, he'll just every now and again say things like. 
um, especially with the new stuff when I was and he was explaining it needs longer notes or it it needs oh no what word was he using for one of the it just made complete sense I was like all right yeah totally get it you know um oh there was one and he goes Oh, soaring. That was the word he was using. So not long notes. It needs to be, just basically, the solo needs to be soaring. So wow. you're like, all right, cool, I get that, I get it. And then he came into the dressing room once and goes, right, you know when you get that last bit, just hit just that, that note, just stay on that note. And I was like, all right, cool. But I, I was just having to do it for the first time yeah. in front of a crowd. <laughs> and when I did it, he looks over and he goes, not that, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's all right, man, just sort of. When you've played. Um, it, when Unless you're doing something completely wrong and then he'd be like, no, 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 man. Yeah, and, and we will sometimes swap between yeah. each other. No, I'll do it. No, no, you have a go at it. And then suddenly, and I might have a go knowing he's had a go, but he's slightly changed it a bit from the record. And yeah. So it's, it's pretty open. When you play it, uh, sorry, when you play Dante Back in Anger and Noel is playing a solo, what's the weird chord? Me and Russ got a guitar out and we were like, we were going through it and we were trying to work like, I, it's an E7 on a piano, but it's like this weird slide up chord from the G shape. Right? What do you play when you when you play that? Um, Stand up for I know what you're saying. Take I, what do I play? I just hit the fucking top note. Is it the top note? Of course yeah, it yeah, is, man. Course it is, yeah, I, I so. You know, there's a lot of ways and means to get around them kind of chords. Really, you know, the last, the down look back in anger in the acoustic version when it goes to the minor. Yeah. There's a really fruity chord you could stick in there, but it, 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 it's not right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just because you can, mm. or it, it would fit. Uh, say it's, I don't know, a flattened fifth augmented, yeah. you know, minor, but. He will, he'll slide up on things like that and really, I mean, there's a million ways to play that chord, but it's not a full chord. Yeah. I thought you were going to say about when you said the weird chord, because it's when I think, basically the guitars are sort of doing F minor, I think, mm -hmm. and but the strings are doing an A flat, I think. Really? So yeah. that's the whole... Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Classic yeah. song. It's yeah, it's a yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's it, 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 it. He'll have just wanted that climb. That's yeah. all when he's written it, I suppose. And, yeah. yeah, I just hit the top string, man, and yeah. just point over know. there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so obviously that, that song means a, a lot to, to a lot of people. And kind of, I have to ask what it was like playing that particular song a few weeks ago in the in Manchester Arena. Um, it's obviously the first show that had been uh, played there uh, since the uh, terrorist atrocity that mm. happened. Um, that song obviously means a lot to a lot of people anyway, let alone what happened um, because uh, it was sung in, in Manchester just mm. afterwards. Um, what what are your memories of playing that particular song? Like, uh, what was the, what was the crowd like? What was? Uh, it's an out of body experience kind of thing. Yeah. Not to be too flowery but like I said the whole day was it just had an air about it and obviously that song is a heavyweight anywhere mm. but that night it had a I don't know it had a kind of aura about it mm. you can only think about it in retrospect, because I wasn't thinking when I was playing it, or oh, it's coming up in the set, and yeah. oh, I hope this goes well or anything. It's not about that. No. Noel said a, a lot of stuff before it, and you know, it was 
look, it's just a horrible situation. And now here we are talking about how, how it felt about a song that night. You yeah. Know? You, do you know what I mean? It's kind of that when that happened, the Manchester thing, that was when I just went, right, something's got to fucking change here. Mm-hmm. I'm sick of going, well, hearing people go, we can be strong, we can stand, yeah. we can carry on. And it's just like, no, this is mm-hmm. not right. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I suppose it's that's what songs are for, aren't they? Mm. To get you through, mm. and that's that's that song. I mean, God knows how normal must have felt. Yeah, you know. He said that I think afterwards. He said that it was the first time he'd been nervous in years for a, right, a gig. Right, right, yeah, yeah, pretty right. Understandable in the, in the circumstances. Yeah, man, I'm getting sort of a little bit goose bumpy now. Actually, thinking about it, and I'm not a drama queen or any of that, you know. Mm. But it was weird. In a good way. Leave it at that, eh? It was an important thing that you did that. That's mm. great. Um, so when the band did split, Oasis split, what was your first emotion when you realised that the band split? Fuck. Um, and sort of an element of not surprised Mm. because it wasn't it wasn't an easy two with that last one the boys were in separate hotels and it just it was a shock because your world has changed like that but you kind of oh I felt well this couldn't have gone on anyway how it was yeah did you feel that you would just Sad. naturally after the tour had ended or um, um no I don't know maybe I was thinking we would finish the tour and there'd be some changes but not split up but there might have been time off there might have been, I'm, I was probably thinking you know on the on the on the on the positive side of things that uh, right well <laughs> when we get through this phase maybe not to put it too lightly but i wasn't thinking oh yeah this is just done but it was knackered mm. yeah 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 you needed the break yeah so you obviously you started up BDR and I went to quite a few of those gigs and those gigs were wild, uh, wild gigs, man. They're really, really wild. They're great. Um, how close were you to releasing material under the Oasis name? And mm, could you have done? Never in a million years. No, 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 no. no. Cool. Um, and uh, one question from a musician's point of view, because Noel's once a quote from Noel said that you're a brilliant producer. And one thing that's really interesting about um, the second album you did, it's a song there called "I'm Just Saying." that you kind of said that it was, I think Andy said it's like a love letter to the fans from the Morning Glory day because it oh, sounds right. exactly like right. it's recorded from the same sessions. Right. And it's like, how the fuck do you go about creating a particular sound from an era like that? Because it honestly sounds like it's recorded the same fortnight that Morning Glory was recorded. The, 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 everything, the guitar sounds, the production, everything. Yeah, but that's weird, isn't it? Because I know I was playing a Rickenbacker. <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Who knows, man? Re- uh, you can't recreate anything because uh, honestly everything is an accident and regarding production um, you know you might get people who really want to source that microphone through that channel strip yeah. into that um, desk and you need this to get that and everything they weren't doing that when they were doing that back in the day nah, they were getting yeah. the nearest thing or the you know the and it was all capturing stuff you know so now you might go for something and it becomes something else. And you got I, th- I do think with recording as well, you, you've got you to be light on your feet with knowing where it's wanting to take you. Yeah. You know. Could you work with Nine Inch Nails as well? Is that no, right? that's a complete fallacy. Oh, Honestly, it's weird. I know, I don't know. I think it came from when we were in the Village studio in LA. Right. And Trent Reznor was in the other studio 
and that's it. That's it. I mean, I honestly, I've hit them with a ping pong. <laughs> I've definitely hit them with a ping pong ball. I know okay, that. that's it. That's yeah. your reduction technique. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> they might have inspired him. To see, how, see how he'll respond to that. <laughs> but no, no, no. That's one of those weird, yeah, myths. myths. So, a question towards the end of BDI. You had an accident. You fractured a skull. Is that yeah, right? yeah, Fuck, yeah. man. What happened? Like, what, can you um, what happened? Or like, you know, are you okay now? Like, no one's seen you for. Yeah, a while well, since um, um, yeah, I am okay, and. Um, it, I, I fainted. That, that, who knows what? Whether it, whether it was a fainting, but I basically passed out. Right. Um, and just fell down the stairs and hit me head on a, on a tiled floor. But I didn't grab for anything. I didn't. You know, there was nothing. It wasn't like I was sort of going. I can't remember it. Yeah. And um, and it was heavy. Yeah, man. But it's quite a few years now, so I'm used to this way of being, I suppose. How's it changed you? Well, I lost my sense of smell. Right. That was the first, and but I didn't realise that at first, um, because all I could really, see, I just had the constant smell of burning plastic. Fuck. I know, and then, then after that all sort of died away, I went, I actually can't smell anything. And... So, when I say that, and people go, well, if you're gonna, if you wanna, if you, you know, if there's one sense you could lose, mm. and you just think, yeah, but you don't get it because it yeah. is actually massively important with yeah. everything, down to, well, you, you know, yeah. food, um, memories, yeah. everything, and I, every now and again, I get pinpoint smells, but it's always the same group of smells. Um, and then other things like uh, I'm definitely more impatient um, because of the accident. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really? It's weird. It, oh man, I had a I can't remember a year, and it definitely changed a few things that you drive. You almost drive yourself mad. I used to say at the time. If I could only just speak to somebody who's been through this, who'd know. But you know, I read all the Richard Hammond stuff and mm. all that, and you just all you've got to do is go. Well, look, I'm here. Yeah, that's it. You know, mm. sound very serious. So yeah, glad yeah, you're yeah. Doing, yeah. You're doing okay well, I did think um, it was just a, a bone break, but it wasn't. It was more because it's it's called a TBI, which is a traumatic brain injury and it's all about how it bounces around in your in your skull yeah. anybody who's listening to this who've who've had it will know what i'm on about it's something you can't you can't describe it just things are different i used to say i used to describe this it's like waking up in somebody else's consciousness because you just make micro decisions about everything mm. because you're not at the normal you yet yeah, you know, and um, have you got a metal plate in or anything? No, like that? no, no, or, no, no. So I was lucky. Yeah. It all it just heals itself. Right. Two weeks later, I fell down again. Did you? And I broke my leg badly, and so I have got yeah, I've right. got a metal rod in that just to. So they were separate incidents. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. And apparently, it's not that uncommon. They, they said. What about so it was to a balancing, have a was second it? fall? Yeah, I've had a million tests and MRIs and all that, yeah. and they can't, you can't see what it was, but. Oh. Anyway, good to see you looking yeah, well, man. man. You're playing well because yeah. you say saw in Rome, man. It's it's shit hot, so it's good to see you <laughs> playing well. Um, quick question: Let's talk about the music industry. Um, you said in 2011, no one's got a fucking clue what's going on in the music industry, uh, <laughs> so we're just doing our thing and keeping it real. Um, how has the music industry reacted and changed in the past six years since you've said that? Um, well, I wouldn't know really, because. I, I, I'd have to answer almost like from an outsider because it changes almost daily. Um, it's unrecognisable from what it was when I got into it. Mm. And In what way? Um, well, the big, obviously the big thing everybody knows is the internet. Yeah. Um, but we still don't know really what that, the reach and effect of that is because... It, that affects everybody from you could record an album now today with somebody in LA but you've never met 
and and that, that kind of thing and you know and people could hear it and whatever but it used to be a physical thing which had to be promoted and you had to go to a shop to get it and the promotion was like literally posters up outside mm. gigs about yeah. the new record or and you were lucky if your band that you like got on top of the pops that w half an hour window a week so th so these th 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 that's unrecognizable to what yeah. it is now isn't it mm. um and i haven't got the first clue about streaming and likes and hits and i don't know what that that kind what of world means. is yeah. you know and whether it's even valid to the actual thing of the music so what challenges are facing musicians today that didn't exist 20 years ago then uh, you've probably got to be just a lot more of a 360 artist yeah but you probably are anyway because you're a kid of today mm. Yeah, yeah. So you, you you know no difference, but um, like when my son and his mate when they're recording, and they're working on an album, and this guy Daniel Hawk is he's going to be a great songwriter, but Joel will be filming him as well when they're recording, and they'll be posting stuff on their site and things yeah. just from you know, and I've seen them do gigs. And Joel not be playing a song, he's a drummer, but he'll be filming from behind. <laughs> and he's booked a slot with their social media after the gig. Now yeah. that, I just... Because he'll go, have you got Wi-Fi? And I'm going, oh, yeah, and I'm thinking he's on about the football. And he goes, no, no, because I've booked some slots and it's all gone. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so that is something I just don't... I, I can only marvel at yeah <laughs> where do you see um guitars being in in 30 years time is do you think technology could merge with guitars more than it is or like well it's that's weird because i see guitars as they make you feel good when you play them that's yeah. it they're great and when you're a kid and you're playing and then somebody else plays with you that's like a, a light bulb moment mm -hmm. what this is the difference and now you see people you know like that tv show guitar star or whatever and you see people using the guitar like it's never been used <laughs> yeah. you know it's kind of what the i mean i'm not just different different approach to just what we've seen up till about 10 years ago because they're not even accompanying their voice mm. they're just they're making this this mad noise you know, there's there's a guitarist called Tommy Emmanuel, I think. Yeah, yeah. He's outrageous yeah. on a bit of wood with strings on it. Yeah. You know, so that's what I'm saying. So it's still, and he's an old fella-ish. Yeah. Probably younger than me, but you know what I mean? It's kind of... That's Lawrence Juba's, mate. Oh, oh is it? Yeah. So we had Lawrence Juba play on a record last year. I think right. You know, he used to play with McCarty. Yeah, McCarty's, McCarty's wings, wings yeah. yeah. And he, yeah, he plays a lot of gigs with Tommy Emmanuel. He's insane. It, it's he's incredible. Totally insane. Yeah. I've seen stuff on YouTube where he's playing one song, I think as he's playing another song at the same time on the same I don't know check it out but yeah, yeah so I'm just saying it's it's still there it's and I like that kind of side of things that it's not some new device but I haven't said that new devices are good as well mm. I mean yeah it all, it's all still moving it's not dying yeah <laughs> what are the common personality traits that separates highly successful musicians from people who haven't made it They didn't give up. <laughs> That's the I answer. Suppose. Yeah. 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 Damien Mancello said exactly the same answer to that question. Don't stop. Yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give to guitarists, young guitarists, specifically? Um, oh, just that word advice. I mean, I'm trying to think. Just crack on because it'll be good to you mm. it, it, like, it, you don't have to make it but if you've got a guitar now we all sound all hippy dippy but it's just good for everything good for the mind it's good for it's like it's like a little therapist or whatever or mate and you'll get a lot out of it and you never stop learning 
Yeah. You know, never. So that's, I mean, come on, you know. It's a game you can't complete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, you can share it as well, see? You can play and you can pass it on. Both of my kids started and stopped. <laughs> <laughs> They're both left-handers, though, which is my other oh. little theory of learning from them. So they've had left-handed guitars around. Yeah. And when you pick them up, and you're just playing it, but it's upside down and backwards and all that, and yeah. you're just in your motor skills, and then you suddenly you'll go, whoa, <laughs> hang on, it does that. I bet Jimi Hendrix did that, because really? he would have always been picking up right-handed guitars. Yeah. and just So his motor skills would have been that other way around yeah you know and that's if thinking like because he's obviously the best to me yeah, yeah. he's a man <laughs> untouchable um what's um so we begin to wrap up yeah um when russ appeared uh, there was a lovely moment where he said that when you did cast no shadow at the bbt bbc2 show about a year or so ago you, you played on i think it's the first gig you played with Noel Gallagher, yeah Brian Burtz. um he said that was his proudest moment he said it, when, if i'm when i'm a grandparent where, was that, where was that the albert hall no 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 the bbc2 uh show that you did um with Noel and russ yeah 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 yeah, yeah. remember you did yeah, a lot yeah. of b-sides and stuff like and, that and yeah. oh yeah so that's it he played his riffing back up and i because i it, it, we were sat down. You were sat so down. So I wasn't like that's right. High flying birds. No. Uh, gig, gig. That's it. Yeah, I so think it was your first time you played with the high flying birds. I think. Right. Not, uh, one of them. That anyway. that that time definitely because yeah. um, why I'm saying the Albert Hall because that's when Noel supported himself, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah anyway, yeah. You sorry. Played some great gigs there. With Noel <laughs> so go on, cast the shadow. Yeah. So he so this beautiful moment where I was editing that episode and he was talking so proudly. He said that's the, that's the moment that I'm going to show my grandparents, uh, show right. grandkids that like that was because like, he did lovely backing vocals in it and stuff like that. And just as I was kind of editing that and kind of fading in that bit of music, that's when I got the email from you saying, "Yeah, let's meet up to, to the interview," yeah, which is like, a great yeah. moment. So what are the shows that you are most proud of? Like if you were to you know, in twenty years back, at twenty years time, look back and go, "That's that's a show to show my grandkids." That I did. Oh, show me grandkids, man! Um, well, <sighs> it would probably be something acoustic with Noel. Mm. You know, because I, I re I've always said I really like that playing quiet side of it something like that probably the Albert Hall something like that mm. I'm now thinking of those kind of sounds done it with a crouch or the Union that, yeah. Chapel or something like that yeah, maybe something thing. like that but you know what I'm actually thinking about something that like my mum would like as well mm. you know so it's, it's I don't know it's kind of just what about Buenos Aires you played some amazing gigs yeah because I'm think I'm actually thinking about all that stuff as well and like there's all the See, when you can tick off stuff like, you know, the Hollywood Bowl or, mm. you know, then, but the gigs aren't really memorable. It's more like the dressing rooms are memorable. Yeah. If you know, you know, and, but then doing like Madison Square Gardens yeah. and them kind of gigs, and you do, I mean, sounding naff here, but you do feel a bit like a king in New York for a night, you yeah. know, and I'm glad to say we did it twice, yeah. like on different tours, yeah. so it's not like you've just clawed your way up to it, but playing Wembley Stadium for the first time, well, because both, both nights, man, you know, because I used to busk on the tube, so that little thing of like, whoa, you know, here we go, Yeah, you know, this is happening, get in the car, on your way to Wembley Stadium. <laughs> there was a buzz that, that and, those and gigs there was such a buzz there's to a photo of me and I'm sat and both my kids were little and I'm sat laying on the couch with my shirt off and both of them are just sat on my stomach and I'm just thinking yeah and I know I'm going to play Wembley that night it's yeah. weird but yeah there's them kind of gigs being lucky enough to, I tell you what the the Ryman in Nashville is a great venue, and that's used to be the Grand Ole Opry. Right, okay. And it's like the Union Chapel. Wow. It's a wooden church. So there's loads, man, loads and loads. And then, you know, playing with Weller, yeah. who when I was a kid, he was like the man for me. I still think he's the best lyricist to come out of England. But um, How does Weller's working practices differ from Knowles in a studio? Um, You know what? I, they're not that dissimilar. 
Um, well, it's a lot. He's very fluid. And he, I used to say, he's just really good at getting the best out of people, I think. And he's very open about trying different things. And, yeah. Um, but they're different because Noel will have the song written, whereas Weller will be writing it at the back of the room. Mm. And when me and Noel have recorded with him, he's writing the words literally in front of you. And Noel doesn't do that, but and well, he, Paul will ask for what about this next bit, you know? And then you'll go, well, this will fit, and, not, and you know, and then it, it'll go in. And not that you want writing credits or any of that stuff, but mm. it's you know, um, echoes round the sun. Yeah, he yeah. rang me after that session. And, what was it again? Was it echoes of the sun? Or echoes, and oh, I know it's echoes round the sun because <laughs> we were all just floating it around at the time. Yeah. But that was that was a great day. Very fast. He's really fast as well. Right. Gets it all done. There's no labouring around, and yeah. But he's he's not slapdash. You mm. know what's he'll have it in his head what he wants, and he'll just try and get it. Be it a keyboard part or, and I'd asked him once about the jam because I was a huge fan. And I was asking him about the producer and the production, and did you have any? And he, he sort of gave me the vibe of, in the early days, it was just like oh, we didn't have a fucking clue, mate. We, we, as in, <laughs> yeah. we just that's what the producer does, kind of thing. Because I was, you know, I mean, them records, mm. just, Jesus Christ, Classic. man, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Top that's a big he's long on, answer. He's on Noel's <laughs> anyway, haven't he? Yeah, he's playing. He's yeah, playing yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, if Oasis reformed. What would you consciously do differently or tweak from what you did before? Well, in ear monitors for a kickoff. And. Yeah, man. I mean, really, that's. It's, it's, it's a bit of a, an oblique question. If Oasis reformed, what would you do differently? Because it would all be different, but weirdly the same. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, I'm, I'm trying to not be flip and go, yeah, fucking go to the bookies straight away and get me winnings, or you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, no. But it, what I mean is, is that if you were to sit down, if you all agreed to get back together and you were going to record again, like when you sat down, how do you think it, would you go, actually, we tried that for 10 years or we tried that in that period, let's maybe do something different or how can we avoid situations like that happening? Well, it all evolved anywhere mm. massively over the years. So it, it certainly wouldn't f feel right to go that's how we should tour because it would evolve anywhere and everybody mm. evolves you know I mean you know the obvious things like don't put everybody on a bus overnight or do you know what I mean yeah. you know I don't know it would be different it would be different and whether that would be right I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's, it's an abstract concept yeah, in ears, basically. Leave it at that, <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> Good answer. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for your insight, your wisdom. Uh, you've brought joy to millions. Your impact on music will be felt and heard for generations to come. Best of luck with the Who Built the Moon tour, and thanks for appearing on the stage of podcast. It's been fun. Great. So that was Gem Archer. What an absolute privilege that was to, to spend those couple of hours at his studio. 
such an enjoyable um, couple of hours and what a great guy. Um, thank you so much again for, for agreeing to appear. And he's off now, um, touring through South America and got lots of dates lined up. Uh, Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds have, just as I'm recording this right now, um, just released uh, Holy Mountain. Or at least it's just had airplay, so I've just heard that for the first time. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting few months um, for, for Noel Gallagher and, and his high flying birds. Um, so uh, you can uh, check out further episodes um, with uh, the, some of the people we mentioned earlier, such as Ibrahim, um, uh, Russ Pritchard, Mikey Rowe of Noel Gallagher's high flying birds, Tony Visconti, um, Steve Cropper, uh, Kieran Pepper of the Prodigy. Um, loads and loads of episodes at stagelifepodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at the Stage of Pod and like us at facebook.com forward slash the Podcast. Do get in touch. Give us a shout. Give us feedback. Um, if you want to get involved in the podcast in any way, um, we are always looking for volunteers. So do give us a shout if you'd like to get involved in some way. Um, the next episode is with Abby from the Zootons, as mentioned. Uh, we've got Wolfgang Fleur uh, coming up soon uh, too. So there's plenty of exciting opportunities um, coming up. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>